told you I lied in my first and second trial to save myself. Well, let's get to the second trial. Just like you're lying here to save yourself, right? I'm not saving myself. I'm telling the truth this time. Right, because now all of a sudden, after eight years, you have developed a conscience. I think that's what you told the jury. No, it's because my, the father of my children was on death penalty at that time on my first trial. So I couldn't, I couldn't give up. If, I, if it was just Charlie, like I said from the trial, go ahead and arrest him. Nobody ever did. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, how is everyone? I am so sorry I was late. I got totally wrapped up in the news about the Holly Bobo case that the main witness has recanted. And as you know, our courts look at recantations with suspicion. But boy, was law in crime, I believe. It may have been Court TV. Was going on about ambitious prosecutors don't care about the truth. I mean, it's, it's it's absurd, these narratives we have going in our, our press <laughs> about prosecutors just not caring about the truth, just being happy, putting away innocent person after innocent person, but okay. That's not what I wanted to talk to you about, but I'm sorry. I, I took a detour today. I wanted to talk to you about Katie McBanawa. What does she know? I feel she knows a whole heck of a lot. And I believe, should she ever tell the t- whole truth, She would be a big part of bringing Wendy down. And you think back to that phone call to Sigfredo and Luis Rivera to get them the heck out of there when Luis Rivera says Wendy was being pointed out to him. Now, of course, Wendy says, it wasn't my day with the kids. I couldn't have possibly been there. But she had a habit of taking the kids when it was not her time, picking them up from preschool. It was a whole issue of contention between Wendy and Dan Markell. So I'm not entirely sure. So they were, Luis Rivera was picking out Wendy. She was with her kids and all, and Wendy made a call. Then Luis Rivera gets a call from Katie to get the heck out of that area. So what is Katie doing? Why was her pro offer so disappointing? Why is she just an okay witness? She's certainly not the witness Luis Rivera is, but she didn't get the deal Luis Rivera did. And and. We're still waiting to see her sentence. Now, interesting things have come to light recently about Katie. And I'm going to get into your comments in a minute. But thanks to Pretty Lies and Alibis, Gigi, thanks for putting this up on your community tab. Katie McBanawa has an account on Meet an Inmate. And very interesting when you read it, it's very, you know, it's like she's just looking, she's lonely in prison. She likes to do yoga and work out in prison, et cetera, et cetera. She's looking for emails. She has access to emails. 
You can email her through blah, blah, blah service. But what's most interesting to me about this is when it says her sentence date to be determined. It's still, still up in the air. Why? Is she going to come back for Donna's trial? But I believe she could be the one to really bring this down. She's still pretending like she didn't know Dan Markell was going to be killed. I mean, come on. Come on, come on, come on. She's protecting herself and her image, but she's protecting an image and a reputation that she doesn't have. The only way out for her is to spill it all. And I know that makes her very hateable. And you have to remember that people who get involved with murders might not be the best people. I think we like to think that if we're all desperate enough, we're all going to participate in a murder. If we all had terrible childhoods, if it's somehow circumstantial. It's a really great book called Inside the Criminal Mind, Forgetting the Author. But he talks about it being, I think it's Dr. Same now. And he talks about it being like people who need stimulation, it being sort of like an addiction. And it, it kind of makes sense. It's, it's just almost like they love the excitement of it. They like cutting corners. And it's a whole treatment of a mindset to rehabilitate people like that. It's part of a uh, part of a more like a I don't know what do you want to call it a lifestyle criminal lifestyle so I think Katie has could really blow this whole thing up and I don't know who's the person to get through to her that you know the only way out is really to to also expose yourself if you went out of prison. I don't know if she's getting it. She's not a dumb woman. She's not brilliant, but she's not dumb. Annette, YouTube 742 says, if Donna had boarded the plane, we were talking about Donna last, if Donna had boarded the plane and taken the flight, could the U.S. still arrested her if she hadn't yet entered Vietnam airspace? Now, that's a, well, they still could arrest her in Vietnam, Annette. It's just, does Leon County want to spend the money to get a bounty hunter, whatever else they'd have to do and all? I don't know what that involves but it's not easy and it's very expensive. And it's, I believe, a lot of legal hearings to get someone extradited to the United States, back to the United States. I've heard you, they, we might have had to bribe pe politicians in Vietnam. I don't know. So it's, it still was possible. And I don't know how you stop a flight in midair, but. Really interesting question. Interesting mind you have, Annette. Scott Michael says, Scott Michael 8071 says, just a lot of unusual comments. It was probably Rash Baum, Rashi, Rashi. You know, I love Rashi. Rash Baum, who called the police to tell them she was headed for the airport, he promised Josh that they would get another million for the Donna trial. <laughs> yeah. 
Rashi, I'm sure. I don't think it's just about money, though, Scott. I think that's a big part of it. But I really think that Rashbaum wants to be kind of like a badass lawyer. And I mean that in the worst sense. I don't think of those lawyers as cool. The Garagoses, the Leslie Abramsons, the Jose Biases type lawyer, these kind of high price defense attorneys. What is going on? Do you guys hear all those sirens? I think that he really wants to be famous. And he's talking to someone off the air. I don't know if they want to be mentioned, so I'll just leave it at that. But she was making the point. He really knows this case intimately. And she was making the point. She was connecting Rashbaum's kind of love of being with criminals and working with people who like to be really comfortable outside of the law. That's my perception. And that was the person I was talking to's perception. She mentioned his poker playing. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That really is still considered the underbelly of our society. Legalized gambling is what professional poker is. So, he showed an interest in this kind of world really before this, but how Donna and Harvey got caught at the airport is interesting. I believe it's part of her indictment. May not be. It may be part of a warrant. Can't remember. I'm sorry, Scott Michael. But what happened, one of the first things that alerted authorities was that friends of Charlie's got a call from Harvey and Donna, and they were like, <clears throat> here, I'll reenact it for you. They were like, um, they were like, hello? Hello, it, it's Donna. Donna, Donna. Donna who? Donna Adelson. Like, they haven't heard from, from the Adelsons in years. And they're like, we're taking a trip. We wanted you to know if you've ever been to I don't know. It's like some other place, not Vietnam. And they're like, no. Uh oh, we were just wondering if you have any like hotel recommendations. And he, <laughs> we're going away. Don't tell Charlie. They're like, Do we, what? They thought it was the most peculiar call. And the minute they, they were like, great, Donna. Okay. Bye bye, honey. You know, that kind of thing. Immediately, like the, the phone receiver immediately, I'm, you can see how old I am, the phone receiver, whatever. The cell phone off button was pushed. And no sooner did they call the authorities and were like, look, we just got like a really weird call, Harvey and Donna Adelson, about some trip they were taking. So that's what alerted authorities. But I like your fantasy a lot that Rashbaum was like, you know, he could have. He could have been an extra call, <laughs> but I don't think so. I think they were really ready for it. So everything got sped it up, you know, into motion. MK Connecticut says, so Innocence Project, wrongful conviction movement, always a subject here on this podcast. When the Innocence Project began in the early 1990s, my understanding was as someone in a career that the Innocence Project might benefit, it was all about DNA. That's right. They said they only took DNA cases. I saw a presentation around 1993 or 1994, and they basically said, if you're aware of someone who is incarcerated, convicted of a crime, of which they are innocent, of course, and that DNA alone might prove their innocence. That's who we're looking for. Our understanding was that they would do the work involved at no charge, reopen the case due to new evidence, but it was all about the DNA solving a crime because incarcerated people couldn't get the evidence tested. So Barry Schecht came off the OJ case and started the Innocence Project with Barry Neufeld and originally that was the idea. And yes, I think people misunderstood. They are a nonprofit organization. I said that, but I don't know if it was heard. They are nonprofit. But the lawyers, 
can get very rich after the Innocence Project work is done, after they release these people, they continue on representing them in the civil suits. And that's where they make the money in our civil courts where the bar of evidence is much lower and they sue for these people's quote unquote wrongful conviction. So I think you make a really good point that DNA alone might prove that. How many cases do people know in the audience where DNA alone proves the case? So what's happened is that they come into cases like think about the Adelson case for Charlie. Well, Charlie's DNA wasn't on the money. Charlie's DNA, I don't know, wasn't on the envelope that was placed in the bag. You know, those kind of things. Would that prove his innocence? But for the Innocence Project, they might celebrate his innocence if it wasn't found on those kind of objects. And DNA makes up a tiny, tiny percentage of criminal uh, cases. In the UK and Wales, it's like 0.2. And it causes a, uh, and it's the center of a conviction 0.01% of the time. So it's a very small percentage. And it is circumstantial evidence. All right, enough about that. Thank you. Very interesting comments. Let us get into Katie Meg Banawa. By the way, sat coming up Saturday. Is my birthday. Thinking about something fun. If you guys have ideas to do on that, on that for that show. Let me know. I'm trying to think about something fun to do. I don't know. You know, maybe it'll just be sort of like a hangout party, but I'd love to do something maybe cooler if I could think of something cooler to do. So let's look at Katie McBanawa's testimony. So this is like the first time where she told some of the truth. And I thought Georgia handled this beautifully. You have to remember that everyone was saying the state is making such a mistake. She's such a liar. It's going to derail their case. She's going to, she's going to crumble on cross. And I thought she did pretty well. I know someone commented they thought she did horribly that she could barely put a sentence together. She's not a wordsmith. I would have to agree with that person. But as a witness, I thought I would give her maybe a B, maybe a, yeah, a B. Uh, yeah, that's what I would give her, a solid B for this performance. Witness may be seated. Please raise your right hand. You of course, she looks a little softer than we've seen her. We've seen her in the braids and, and the glasses and sort of looking more severe with her hair down. She looks a little softer. And of course, she has this stress offer of lying totally. She only has to lie a little bit, it seems like. That's my feeling. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. You may take your seat. Please speak loudly and clearly. Yes, Your Honor. Ma'am, please say your name and spell your name. Catherine McBonoa, K A T H E R I N E. M A G B A N U A. Thank you for all the birthday wishes. Maybe I could get some banana bread, a round of banana bread for everyone. I would love that. I would love a Wendy indictment for my birthday. That would be a great gift. I've been asking for one. 
And let me just change the, here, this is a little bit better, I think. I see that you're in jail clothes. Are you currently in custody? Yes, ma'am. What are you in custody for? The murder. Are you doing a sentence for murder? Yes, ma'am. You were convicted of murder? Yes, ma'am. And is that the murder of Dan Mark? Um, <laughs> listen to the way she does that. Uh, mur murder? Like, so, so, <laughs> like, under her breath. Like, she's in, in line for the ladies' room. Uh, murder? Murder? Uh, what did you do time for, Katie? What were you in prison for? Uh, uh, murder? Like, if I say it really softly... Maybe nobody will hear me or notice that I, I'm doing a life sentence for murder. For murder? For murder? <laughs> what? It's, oh. Uh, and you just think if she said no, if she weren't so greedy, Dan Markell might still be alive. I mean, you could make, I mean, that's an interesting thought experiment, I I think a lot of people could argue that Charlie was so determined to please his parents and show that he wasn't a chump, he wasn't a sucker, the worst thing to be in the Markell family. Their whole M.O. seemed to be to make other people suckers, to get over and to never get over, which makes it so ironic that they were victims of a Ponzi scheme. But a lot of people seem, this is what I've heard. It's a rumor in New York. I haven't met anyone myself who's admitted to this, but can get into Ponzi schemes, knowing they're Ponzi schemes, and just don't want to be the last one out. Like, we'll get in before it collapses, get a really good interest rate, and get out. But getting out is very hard when you're getting a 30% interest rate like the Adelsons were. All right, back to her. Back to Katie. Markel? Yes, ma'am. Did you have a trial in your case? Yes, ma'am. Did you testify? Yes, ma'am. You testified in your own, on your own behalf? Yes, ma'am. All right. And when you testified, were you truthful with the jury? No, ma'am. I was not. Did you take the same oath that you just took today in your own trial? Yes, ma'am. What was your defense when you were tried? That I had nothing to do with it. All right. Did, that we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson and we got it right in reference to the killers, yes, but you weren't in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Was that true? No, ma'am, it was not. Were you in the middle? Yes, ma'am, I was. And didn't you also testify in the trial in which Siegfried... What do you guys think about this yes ma'am, no ma'am stuff? Katie has done this all the way through in all of her testimony. Through her first trial, which got a hung jury. Her second trial, where she got convicted. And in her second trial, Sigfredo Garcia was supposed to be the big surprise witness coming to save the day. And that would have been an interesting cross-examination had he testified. He didn't do it. But the, the cross-examination, you would have thought, would have been, we hear that Katie has you wrapped around her finger. We hear that she do it. No, is, is, isn't that true? No, yes. I mean, what's a good answer to that? You'll do anything to save the mother of your children. That's what how that cross-examination would have gone. But KWAS was announcing to everybody that, that he was going to come in and, and say she had nothing to do with it. Never showed. Fredo Garcia was convicted of murder. Yes, ma'am, I was. And what was his defense? That he had nothing to do with it. That we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson and we got it right in reference to the killers, but he had nothing to do with it, Yes, right? ma'am. And was that defense truthful? No, ma'am, it was not. So Sigfredo Garcia was 
involved. Yes, ma'am, he was. So why tell the truth now? I believe that the truth needed to come out now so that the family can get some type of closure. Why didn't the truth need to come out last year or the year before or the I, year before that? I was trying to defend myself. You were trying to get off? Yes, ma'am. Did you think you'd be successful in your trial with that defense? I thought so. Has anyone promised you in anything promised you anything for your testimony here today? No, ma'am. Weren't you originally offered immunity for cooperation in this case? Yes, ma'am, I was. But you didn't take us up on that? No, ma'am, I didn't. Because you thought you could get off completely? Yes, right? ma'am. And now you're doing a life sentence? Yes, ma'am, I am. Did Charlie Adelson threaten to harm you if you told the truth? No, ma'am, he didn't threaten me. Did anybody threaten you to keep your silence? No, ma'am. Did anybody promise you anything if you remained silent all these years? I wasn't promised anything, but I mean, the I wasn't promised anything. Go ahead, finish your thought. You didn't, you weren't promised anything, but what? I thought everything was gonna be okay. You thought, you thought you'd be acquitted. Yes, ma'am. All right, so did you know Dan Markell? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you have any personal beef with him? No, ma'am, I did not. What was your motivation for becoming a part of this murder plot? Financially. So not as a favor to Charlie Adelson? I'll rephrase it, Your Honor. Was it a favor to Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am, it was. Okay, but your primary motivation? Look at Charlie shaking his head. Look at that face. He is pissed. First, you have Luis Rivera on the stand, now Katie. See, the plan was everybody keep their mouth shut. And I don't know exactly how it was done, how I believe they bamboozled the judge. This is my opinion. Because I don't see Katie, even with her sister, her sister-in-law and that theft, I don't believe her brother, I don't believe anyone in her family could afford the kind of legal help that she got, nor Sigfredo Garcia. So I believe, and it came out a little bit, got caught, that the plan was, through Charlie's lawyer at the time, that everybody keep quiet. The plan was everybody was going to keep quiet. We'll get good lawyers. Everybody keep quiet. Great lawyers cannot get over bad facts. And when you have a lot of pieces of circumstantial evidence, and that's what defense lawyers do so well, is to get you to forget about all those little pieces of circumstantial evidence and focus on one little question mark. Like maybe it was an extortion on an extortion. Ridiculous story, but okay. And was not favor to Charlie Adelson? Well, yes, ma'am, it was. And financially. All right. Because you were going to get paid for yes. your part? Yes, How much did you get paid? Um, I don't know the exact amount. What was your relationship to Charlie Adelson? He was my ex-boyfriend. When did you meet him? I believe that was in 2013. Do you know what month? Um, has to be around September. Can you point him out and describe what he's wearing? He's sitting over there with a blue jacket and a blue tie. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Show you what it marked as states 48. 
recognize this exhibit? Yes, ma'am, I do. How do you recognize it? Um, that's when we went to Key West. Is that a fair and accurate photo of you and Charlie Aylson? Yes, ma'am, it is. Is that when the two of you were taken when the two of you were dating? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time, I ask to move into evidence states 48. Okay, objection. No objection, Your Honor. 48. Do we have that for publication? Can we just point out how great Georgia Kappelman is in this? She handled this beautiful, beautifully. We got it right in this this case, except for you. All the little elements, and it and it points out to the jury that for this conspiracy to work, it needs many little elements. So you can't just take out Charlie Adelson, and it makes the idea of an extortion on an extortion even more improbable that all these people are going to do it themselves and get this great idea to kill someone he hates to extort money. But boy, did she benefit from this financially. Would you like a cruise? Oh, yes. My mother and I would like a cruise very much. Would you like half a, a breast job? <laughs> I really believe that that was probably a total, you know, he paid for it totally. I don't believe, I don't even know where she could come up with half of it, but okay. But it's so much more fun to talk about the half a boob job, one breast. And did he pick the left or the right to pay for? That's what I want to know. Georgia Kappelman Appreciation Society. Shout out to everyone who's in my Facebook group. Just this discussion about the case and appreciation of the people who prosecuted this case on Facebook. So also working on some things for Patreon. <clears throat> Finally getting that episode out, hopefully soon, about Wendy's podcast. So was this photo taken before or after the murder? Before. Who came up with the idea to kill Dan Markell? Charlie. So Sigfredo Garcia didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. Luis Rivera didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. When did the defendant first bring this idea up to you? My first recollection was around Halloween of 2013. Around Halloween or on the actual? On, on Halloween, yes, ma'am. All right. What, what, what's your recollection of how that came up? Um, we were at a Halloween party in Lincoln Road. And right before we were about to go, he got in the car with me and he asked me a question. What was the question? Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Who was that? Sigfredo. And at the time, what was your relationship with Sigfredo? It wasn't the best. But he was the father of your children, right? Yes, ma'am. So were you dating both men at this time, or were you only dating no, Charlie? No, I was only dating Charlie. Okay. And so he initially, he meaning the defendant, initially said, do you know anyone that could harm someone. Was he aware of your connection to Zegredo Garcia when he made not, that statement? Not that I know of. No, ma'am. Did you suggest Zegredo Garcia at that time to the defendant? No, ma'am. What I, did you say? I just said yes and kind of left it alone. All right. Did it go any further than that at that time? Not at that, not that night. Okay. I don't did you so. know who he wanted harmed? Did at that time? No, man. You know, not to harp on anyone's bad taste in dating partners, but I've certainly had my share of of duds. 
<laughs> that I'm not proud of. But someone said to me, do you know anyone that can rough someone up or harm someone or whatever the language used? I love when Georgia brings up the rough up thing to Charlie. Like, oh, isn't that an interesting... Excuse me. Isn't that an interesting coincidence that roughed up is being used again here? I I think I would run. What do you, what do you guys think? All right. Had you become aware during the course of your relationship with him that he had some kind of issue going on with his sister's ex-husband yes ma'am I did what did you learn about that he was just stating that his family wasn't his mom and dad was stressed and that his sister was having problems with her husband and custody of her two children and when did you learn that the person that the defendant wanted harmed was this ex-husband of the sister I believe later on all right. And did you, when did you learn the name Dan Markell? It wasn't until, I don't know if it was on my trial or when Secreto got arrested. Okay. So even when he was killed, you didn't know the name of the person that was being killed. Yes. I never knew his name. How did the defendant refer to this person, if not by the name Dan or Danny Markell? Wendy's husband. Okay. So you knew that the person. Katrina Heatherton, you're becoming the fairy godmother of the Roberta, <laughs> Roberta Glass podcast here. Thank you so much. Very generous of you to gift five memberships. So appreciate it. And shout out to the Society page and Katie Cool Lady. Just listening to their conversation today. Learned a lot about the society page. Boy, is he exposed. <laughs> it was really interesting. Uh, so thank, thank you, uh, Katrina. I appreciate it so much. Person that was going to be initially harmed was Wendy's husband. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And and you knew that there were issues or what did you know about the beef with him? Um, that, I mean, he was just, he painted this picture that this was a terrible man and making his family go through a lot custody wise with his sister. Right. And was when he would say these things to you, is it in the context of his mom specifically or his family in general? I believe it was more towards his mom. Meaning what? That his mom hasn't been sleeping, his mom is not eating. I know his dad wasn't wasn't the best health either, but it was he would refer to his mom a lot. All right. And the reason she wasn't sleeping or eating, did that have to do with this ex-husband of Wendy? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever tell the defendant who it was that was going to be doing the job? No, ma'am, I did not. Why didn't you say the name? What a nightmare for Ruth Markell to have to sit through this trial. I mean, I can't imagine ever taking part in anything like this. But I, I would never stop apologizing. I, I mean, if I were ever a part of it, something like this. How? Oh. I mean, people talk about, oh, the courage of witnesses. There's nothing like the courage of victims' family members. Big Fredo to Charlie Adelson. I always referred to each other as my friend. Either, neither one of them wanted to really hear each other's names. And is why is that? Uh, because Sigfredo was the my the father of my kids, and I was dating him at that time. I was dating Charlie at that time. Okay, so Sigfredo Garcia, did he have strong feelings about the defendant? Yes, he didn't like him. 
All right. And is that because you were dating him? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And vice versa, you're not going to talk about the child's father with the new boyfriend either? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So is it true then that you were sort of walling these two off from each other before the issue of the murder and the conspiracy ever even arose? Yes, ma'am. And did that pattern continue throughout the murder conspiracy? Yes, ma'am, it did. Do you think Charlie Adelson knew that it was your child's father that you were going to? He might have had an idea, but he just never said it out loud. There's one phone call between, I think it's from Sigfredo Garcia to Harvey Adelson. Pretty interesting comment here from Rabbit. The Markell family nightmare is that Dan would have helped Katie to be her best and seek solutions for her life to improve. But Katie met Charlie, not Dan Markell. Tragic. But yeah, her values are all messed up. That same, that same greed really united Katie and Charlie together. Very similar values. You see what she talks about. Never about her kids. Very rarely. Unless she needs something from Charlie. I think there's like one call where she's asking, he's calling in Tylenol or telling her to Tylenol or whatever. Father of the defendant. But very rarely talks about her kids. Anything of real value. <laughs> Do you know anything about that phone call? That was on July 1st of 2014. Yes, ma'am. What do you know about that phone call? Um, from the trial, what I remember was that Sigfredo had contacted or was trying to contact um, Charlie, but we were in a heated argument at that time. We were kind of in the middle of the street, and I guess it's the first thing he looked up was his um, work number. All right, so you say you're in a heated argument. Is this the confrontation that occurred where all y'all were, you and the defendant were going jet skiing? I believe that was after. It was after that incident? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how many interactions personally, face-to-face, -face, did, to your knowledge, Charlie Adelson have with Sigfredo Garcia? That was probably the only one that I, I remember was that jet ski accident. Accident? Or, or like the confrontation. All right, tell us what happened at that confrontation. Um, Sigfredo had just picked up the kids and he was eating at a corner pizza place with the kids and he saw that Charlie was coming by to go pick me up and I guess saw the jet skis in the back of the car. I believe that this is a totally made up call, uh, call conversation, a totally made up story. Even though Katie told her friend, I believe Charlie told her to tell somebody but I, I don't believe that Sigfredo Garcia all of a sudden got confrontational with Charlie to this level right off. And we never heard about any other kind of harassment ever again, any kind of jealousy rivalry ever again, except out of Katie's mouth that they hated each other. Fine. You can hate someone, but this kind of confrontation to go from zero to 90 out of nothing. I believe this story was made up to give context to why Sigfredo Garcia would have called Harvey Adelson. And it's the big clue that Harvey was part of this. This was a family affair. I'm hoping to do an episode on this soon about how you really have to look at the Adelson family. I'm not talking about Robert. Never am. The estranged oldest brother who somehow was gifted with a kind of moral compass that the rest of them didn't. The rest, to my eye, 
look like a entire family of antisocial personality types. Certainly Wendy, very much so. Listen to Jeffrey Lacoste. I mean, he had to go to therapist. Therapist was like, you're dating a psychopath. He's like, what? Then he confronts Wendy with it. And she's like, well, I don't know if I'm a psychopath or not, but I don't feel anything. Who, who, who sort of brushes off such a accusation? Like, mm, psychopath, nothing to me, means nothing to me. I don't feel anything. I'm proud of it. I don't have any compassion, any empathy. I, I'm just not built that way. She knows that these psychopaths know it. They know this about themselves. And certainly driving by the, the crime scene, she needs to dance along the edge. She needs that little bit of danger. Not only can she not help herself, she has that need to control everything, need to know everything, more knowledge, more power, more control. But she loves to dance along the edge and let Jeffrey Lacoste know, well, you know, my brother, he looked into hiring a hitman last summer for fifteen or $50,000. Oh, yeah? Just throw that into conversation. Why? So Jeffrey Lacoste can look like a madman when he tells everybody. She wanted to gaslight the whole world and have Jeffrey Lacoste looking like a jealous, crazy person. Not the Adelson family, not the upstanding Adelson family. Didn't go exactly as planned, did it, Wendy? So he loaded up the kids and cut us off, was screaming a couple things out loud, but we didn't really hear anything because our windows was up. All right. Did you say he cut you off? Do you mean in traffic? Um, in the back, in the back street of where I lived at that, at that time. All right. And when you say he cut you off, did he run you off the road or something else? He kind of just went right and blocked the road in front of us. So Charlie had to kind of do a three point turn and go around the other way. Did the two men actually get out into the street and confront each other? No, ma'am, they did not. Okay. Were any actual words exchanged through the windows? Through the windows, yes, but I had my window up, so we didn't know what Sigfredo was saying. All right. So Sigfredo shouted some things. Thank you so much, Lynn, True Crime Project. Appreciate you becoming a member. And, of course, who doesn't want a banana bread emoji, a Roberta <laughs> True Crime uh, emoji. There's a lot of fun ones in there. And they change depending how long you've been a member. He's out the window. Did Mr. Adelson do the same? No, he did not. And what were the things that were shouted out the window? Were you able to hear them or not? I didn't hear anything. All right. And at this point, this is July 1st of 2014, the, the plot is already underway to do this murder, right? Yes, ma'am. Does Sigfredo Garcia know that he's doing the murder for Charlie Adelson? To my knowledge, he might have had an inkling about it, but... So Katie, little known fact, Katie and Charlie went to the same college... Joy Matt says, I can't believe Katie went away to college and graduated only to have this loser Sigfredo follow her to Orlando and move in. I mean, isn't he, Joy, like the epitome of loser? <laughs> I hate to use that word, but, oh, uh, like never has a dime, never works, only wants to really be part of the criminal lifestyle his best friends the latin king i mean come on boy is he boy is he unappealing she almost had a chance to make something of her life yeah great point 
I don't know. That was never spoken of. Okay. The killers, and when I say the killers, I'm referring to Garcia and Rivera, knew they were doing something for a lady to get her kids back. Do you yeah. know how they knew that information? I believe it's because of the envelope that Charlie gave me to pass okay. over. So you didn't relay that information to them that it had to do with a lady and her kids. I might have mentioned it to Secreto, yes. Okay. So if you mention that to to Secreto, would you be, I guess, were you intentionally trying to characterize this job as being related to someone other than Charlie Adelson? I believe so, yes. Because is that because Secreto Garcia would not have wanted to do anything to help out Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. All right. So do you think Sigfredo knew that this lady with the kids was somehow connected to Charlie Adelson? I believe so. All right. And there was going to be a lot of money paid for this job, right? Yes, ma'am. Did you know anybody else with that kind of money or that might have had that kind of money to, to get this job for them? No, ma'am, I did not. All right, you mentioned the paper. Luis Rivera said there was a paper that Sigfredo had when they came to do the murder. Do you know anything about that paper? No, ma'am, I don't. All right. Did you provide a paper to Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, I did. All right, and when you say you don't know anything about it, but you gave it to him, you obviously know something about it, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so tell us what, I know what you're trying to say is you don't know what was on the paper. The content of it. Yes. Tell us how you got the well, paper. Well, we know that. That's right. Well, he sustained this government for the use of the paper. Tell us how you came into possession of this paper that the killers had. Okay. One day, um, just a random night that I was over at Charlie's house, he had a manila envelope that was sealed he told me, Katie, do not open it. Do not touch it. Do not look inside it. I didn't print this paper out from my office, printed it probably from another office and basically relate, you know, give that paper to the other person. All right. And who is saying this? This was Charlie. All right. This defendant. Yes, ma'am. So he says to you, I have this paper. How does he give it to you? I had a diaper bag, so he showed me the envelope and I was like, just put it in there. Did he express any concerns about fingerprints being on the envelope or the contents? Yes, ma'am. He said he wore a glove so that there's no fingerprints on it. He was, he told, he was very specific about me not opening it and not looking inside it. And he also told me that he didn't print it from his office. All right. And what about licking the envelope? And that he didn't lick the envelope. He said he did not lick the envelope? He did not lick that. And what was the purpose of that? I guess his DNA. Okay. So did you touch the envelope? I mean, washed money. These people were so afraid of DNA. Washed money, not licking the envelope. Not. I mean, it's smart, but was the envelope, was any of that ever recovered, the uh, envelope? Does anyone know? I've never heard it mentioned besides in testimony by besides being referred to in testimony. It was, ne it's never, it's not part of the. Is it part of the evidence? I don't know. I'm asking you, I've never seen it. Uh, it was in my diaper bag, but I don't remember if I ever, I never opened it, but I might've touched it just to put, stick it inside in my diaper bag. And did you deliver the envelope to Sigfredo Garcia. Um, I call, I contact, I must have contacted Sigfredo and just told him, hey. Um, I'm a unicorn. Thank you so much for becoming a member. I appreciate it. And uh, appreciate it so much. come by the house and then you know he was kind of in and out of my life so he'd pop up he literally got the envelope I was like I, you have something inside that bag and then he grabbed it 
stuffed it in his pants and left. In regards to the June trip that the killers made, did you provide Garcia or Rivera with any money for expenses yes, associated with that trip? Yes, ma'am, I did. And where did you get the money from to do that? From Charlie Adelson. Can you tell us about that? What was what Sick. was the context of you getting that money? Sick Fredo would just ask me, hey, um, I'm going to need some money. I need to go out of town. And I'm like, okay. So then I'd go to Charlie or I'd be at Charlie's house and I, I'll tell him I, I need some money for the expenses. And he gave you some money? Yes, ma'am. About how much money, if you know? I can't recall, but it was a couple hundred dollars. So this thing started back in October of 13 and doesn't get done until July. A couple hundred dollars? Doesn't that sound pretty cheap for two people? Gas, everything? Renting a car, hotel. It had to be more than that, right? July of, of 14. Is there, can you describe whether there's any pressure as time is going on and this thing is not getting done? Um, trying to remember, like, in the beginning of the year, I don't think there was really much. I mean, he was, he's been planting this seed in my head that this needed to get done, this needed to get done. And I guess towards probably around June, July is when he was a little bit more adamant about this job getting done. Yeah, everybody in the chat saying they're thinking it was 5,000, which sounds about right. And if you remember, they were parting it up. Sigfredo was doing his favorite substance and then they held up someone. Remember? Remember that testimony? Anyone? Visit Murder by Maestro's channel for more on that. That was at the first trial. For fun, and this really goes into, really circles back to how I started talking about the criminal mindset. They didn't need money. So they run into a guy. They say, hey, do you know where you can get a certain substance? And brings it back to them, and they're all hanging out, and he pulls a gun on him and tells them to strip naked. That's what Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia do for fun. And you can see it in Luis Rivera's pro offer interview, where he's saying, I, I, when I found out that the Adelsons had money, why didn't we just go rob them? Like his eyes light up. It's like the best idea ever. It's like what he does for fun. Very much like that criminal element, the Adelson family. We can get over, we can get something. We can make suckers out of people. We can get something. It'll be fun and exciting. It's like something to do. Benefit us. It's easy. It's sitting there. They won't miss it. You know, there's all sorts of rationalizations for that. Done. Okay. And when you say he, you're talking about who? Charlie. Did you ever have any contact with any other Adelson about this job? No, ma'am. In the context of you know, this needs to get done, this pressure getting put on you, is is there ever a mention of the mom, Donna, or the divorce situation in the context of getting it done? Um, at that time, not that I could recall. Will you publish 35, please? Is this you on the left side of the screen? Yes, ma'am, it is. Right. And was this picture, where was this picture taken? This was in South Beach. Um, I believe the building that they were living at, at the, where 
Charlie's parents were living at. Is that the icon? I don't, I don't think that was an icon. I, it was somewhere in first in ocean. Okay. So a different residence. Yes, ma'am. All right. And this photo, was this the first time you'd ever met Wendy or had you already known Wendy before this photo? I met her one time prior to this because I believe this was in Father's Day. So I met her around spring break when I had dinner with her and uh, Jeffrey. Okay. So the... So uh, can you imagine the conversation between Wendy and Katie? How does that go? Oh, I was a Scott, you know, a what uh, I don't can't even remember the name of it. Excuse me. But it's uh, like as it, it's not a Rhodes Scholar, but it's like something al along those lines. Graduated Magnum Cum Laude from Brandeis. And she graduated from like one of the worst. And that's what I've heard colleges florida and what do they have in common and wendy is so stuck up what do they talk about shoes i don't know you tell me yard bird restaurant yes ma'am all right so this was the second time you'd met her yes ma'am did you have a relationship with her outside of her being charlie's sister no ma'am i did not did you communicate with her by phone or through any app apps or anything like that no ma'am i did not did you receive any communication from her specifically about the homicide? No, ma'am, I did not. Society pages say, murder. We have murder in common. Really? Do you like, are you interested in being part of a conspiracy, a murder conspiracy? Because I have this ex-husband who's threatening to censure my law license. <laughs> Maybe get me fired from my job doesn't want to let me move to Miami with the kids when the kids are just the right age for my mother, just the age she likes, just right around that kindergarten age. She was a kindergarten teacher. And she's also being threatened by this horrible guy with parental alienation when all my mother did was tell the children, educate them on how stupid their father was. You know, the guy who graduated from Harvard and then Harvard Law School, that guy, that dum dum. <laughs> I mean, what do they talk about? Did Wendy ever give you any money or other gifts? No, ma'am, she did not. Did anybody pay you for your part in the murder other than Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am, they did not. All right. And the payments from Charlie Adelson, did those include? The Psychopaths Book Club. Yeah, I read a great book. Was it my book? Was it my book? This is my story. It's I, I wrote a book, and it's about a woman. Let's call her mm, Lily. Lily is married to a mean, unconnected guy who doesn't appreciate her brilliance. And he's stony. Josh Stone, he's so cold. He's a cold fish. And she's in a loveless marriage in stuck in the panhandle town of Malahassee. <laughs> it's oh wow, that's really cool. Is it is it based on your own life? No, no, not, not at all. It's based on a, a friend of mine's life. You know, I have this friend with very similar circumstance. Well, anyway, this lawyer is really wonderful. She does all this work with victims of trafficking. And as great as she is, this husband won't see it. Oh, wow, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, and it goes in through the lives of the people she's helping, that she tells their story. Wow. Wow, that must have been really amazing that you could give them voice. Yeah, it was, it was. But I don't like to talk about myself. So let's talk about something else. What do you think of my big blue eyes? Aren't they blue? I mean, is that how it went? Include the checks that were signed by his mother from yes, the Adelson Institute? Yes, ma'am, it was. Did you 
perform any job at the Adelson Institute? No, ma'am, I did not. You didn't go up there and clean on the weekends? No, ma'am, I did not. On the night of the murder, did you go to the defendant's house? Yes, ma'am, I did. And where was that house or what house was that? That was in <laughs> Whale Harbor in Fort Lauderdale. All right. And did you get payment for the murder that night? I believe it was the following morning. Were you in a panic when you arrived at his house? Was I in a panic? In a panic. I, I wasn't in a panic, but Charlie was. Okay, explain that. How was he acting? Uh, when I opened the door, he had, he was kind of frantic. By the way, so I'm working on this episode for Patreon about Wendy and her freaking podcast. Who makes a podcast that immediately after their ex-husband's murder to talk about it? I know it's really uncomfortable when I meet new people. I don't, I don't know whether, how to, how to talk about it. Well, you seem to be doing pretty well, Wendy, in your podcast. I love the one, the one group member who's like, hmm, um, I don't get a lot of, <laughs> she's like so on to Wendy, like, ah, hmm, <laughs> like you seem a little cold about this, not sure how you were feeling. I get a lot of, a, a lot of you, I got a, a lot of you in this and your victimization, but not a lot of how you felt about your ex-husband and your part in this. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy. That podcast, who makes a podcast who doesn't like to talk about themselves? Let me just tell you, having a podcast for the last six years, do you know how hard it is to get people who aren't lawyers, who aren't people who, who pu talk publicly for a living to talk on a podcast because those are some of my favorite guests to get people with unusual stories. One of my favorite episodes that I've ever done was with a, just with a supporter of Adnan Syed who changed their mind about the whole thing and was really involved in the innocence movement. But if you're lucky to get somebody, to talk, most people do not like to talk about themselves publicly like that, especially about sensitive issues or things that don't make them look totally a hundred percent, excuse me, a hundred percent great. And here's Wendy just joining up, like going to this class. Can't wait to make a little podcast and get feedback from the class about it. And it's so interesting that she, it's like everything in her life is done by imitation. So she sounds exactly like the same cadence as an NPR or a Sarah Koenig. Really interesting. And he had a gun in his hand and he was just all over the place. Was that normal behavior for him? Not having a gun in his hand, no, ma'am. All right. Did you know him to have a gun prior to that? Yes, ma'am. He has a gun safe. All right. But he just didn't usually carry around in his hand? Yeah, he's never had it in his hand. Turn the phone off, please. What was he saying to you when he was in this frantic state? I can't really recall because he he had given me some Xanax, so I it was a little blurry that night, and um, I I just tend to, I just fell asleep. I think we both fell asleep. So. All right. Can you tell the jury whether the excitement that he was showing had to do with the murder or something else? Yes. About that pill she took. I love when Charlie gets on the stand. He's like, she took it from my bottle. I didn't give it to her. Like I have to protect my, my medical license. I don't want it taken away from this testimony. Because once I get acquitted for from murder and conspiracy to murder, I I want a, I want to have a clean record. <laughs> Ridiculous! It's all Katie's fault. Yes, ma'am. It, it had to do with that. Okay. Um. 
Was anybody else there at his residence when you arrived? At that day, no, ma'am. Okay. Did you ever see his parents at the residence? No, I didn't see his parents. Okay. How was the money packaged when you got it? I think you said you got it the next morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It How was, was it packaged? It was in um it was in a plastic, the money was in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag that was inside a brown bag and then like a grocery bag over it. And was the money stapled? Yes, ma'am, it was. Can you explain how it was stapled? Like what size bills and what? I packed it in a little bag like a sandwich. And then I put it in a brown paper bag. Like it was just like a brown paper bag lunch. But it was just a money, a laundered moldy money for murder. Yes. You tell him, Katie. You tell him how it was done. I packed him a little lunch, a, a little a little murder basket. Increments were stapled together. Uh, I believe it was stapled in. I never counted it, but it was like in a stack and it was stapled in the corner. All right. Were they $100 bills or something else? They were $100 bills and there was some 20s and 50s. Okay. And was the money damp? Yes, ma'am, it was. Explain what, what you mean to the jury. Um, a couple days after that, um, I went and I opened the bag and I called Sigfredo and I told him, I was like, there's mold on this money. And he's like, well, blow dry it. And I was like, but why would there be mold on the money? And he's just, I don't know, just blow dry it. So um, I believe his parents or his mom might have washed the the money. It's like a comedy show. I think the parents might have washed the money. They might have gotten that idea of money laundering wrong, but they just didn't want any any DNA on there. And then it got moldy. I love that Sigfredo knows what to do. He's like, blow dry it. That'll get rid of the mold. See, if Sigfredo had not gotten involved with this murder, he might have had his own YouTube channel. Handy criminal tips. What to do with moldy money, a how-to. Don't you hate it when you get hired to do a job, wink, wink, and the money's all moldy? Just just uh, blow dry it, guys. Money? You mean like physically wash the money? Yes, ma'am. And why do you think his mom did it? Because he, oh, he was always adamant about telling me he didn't have any money in his house. And he told me that his parents had just stopped by right before I got there. Okay. So all of a sudden he had money to put in my in the trunk of my car the was following the morning. Was the money I'm sorry I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Was the money already sorted out and packaged when you first saw it or was he doing that? No, it was already there? stacked and sorted out. Okay. And did he have to so he didn't have to go anywhere to get the money. He already had it when you arrived. Yes, ma'am. Was there any argument that night about the money or the next morning? With me and Charlie? Yes. No. <clears throat> Did you, I guess you. Mo Freedom, it makes it, Mo Freedom says, Roberta, don't you know, washing money makes it kosher. I would disagree. I would say it's, it would make it kosher style. Very important distinction. You may have been confused. It really only makes it kosher style. That's how <laughs> that's how the Adelson show. I mean, is this like a comedy we're listening to here? It was packed and then it was packed in plastic in case anything happens to it. See, Donna, Donna thinks of everything. What if it drops in some water? They're in a boating accident. We want to make sure the money survives. It's wrapped in plastic bags. I mean craziness you did stay there that night you may have already said that yes i fell asleep was there any argument with with the defendant at all about anything that night no ma'am not that i can recall did you threaten him in any way no ma'am i did not Judge, may we continue with your examination did you the night that you went to get the money, 
Did you threaten Charlie Adelson in any way? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you try to extort money out of him? No, ma'am, I did not. The money that he gave you, is that something that had already been discussed or agreed upon in reference to this homicide? Well, I, I believe yes, because it was, it was going to be payment for this. You weren't, well, were you sent with a message from Sigfredo to tell him he better give it up or else? No, ma'am. Did you relay to the defendant that? It's all Katie, because Charlie at six foot feet and Katie at five feet two. She's going to be an intimidating figure to Charlie. And a hundred and what, 20, 30 pounds of nothing. She was so, when she said, open your safe, Charlie said, okay. Oh, by the way, Dubin, Josh Dubin, the jury consultant, looked to Murder by Maestro's channel for his wadir, where he harangued the jury pool endlessly. excuse me, I had to cough, about their bias. He was on Joe Rogan today. What a sleazebag that guy is, in my opinion. Don't sue me, Josh Dubin. Checking out Georgia Kappelman, haranguing the jury about their bias, misrepresenting <laughs> what they're supposed to do to the jury pool. Uh Horrible, horrible, creepy. I mean, I just think of like a sea creature when I think of him. Boy, is he is he on my loathing list? His family was in danger if he didn't give you whatever it was you were asking for. No, ma'am. How did Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera get paid for their part in this murder? Um, that morning. I, when I woke up, I was like, oh, my God, I, I got to go. So I I drove back down, and I was trying to look for Sigfredo and having a hard time that morning. And then eventually I made it to the alleyway of where Lewis's building was. Was that on Nor uh, North Miami? Yes. In like 135th. Where he lived with Jessica? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. And he just, I was just waiting in the car and all of a sudden Sigfredo just like popped up and got inside the passenger seat. All right. So they got their money from you. Yes, ma'am. Sigfredo did. And Rivera got paid as well, didn't he? I believe so. Yes. All right. I want to draw your attention to what we're calling the bump. You know what we're talking about? Yes, ma'am. Okay. After the bump and the subsequent conversations were occurring did you have any contact with any other adelson about the bump other than charlie adelson no ma'am so you didn't talk to wendy about it no ma'am i did not didn't talk to harvey or donna about it no ma'am i did not on the dolce vita meet charlie adelson is going through all sorts of different shades of color on his face he started out kind of like a light gray and mad and now he's going to like a very pale the color is just leaving his face as this goes on this testimony goes on i'm going to take a quick break for a pal just a quick palate cleanse and a break and i'll be back after this if you are enjoying this episode of My True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Oh, that was a good one. Um, I think I need a little bit more of a 
palate cleanse. I just need a little bit more of a little bit, something a little bit lighter. I'm finding this extremely depressing today. I don't know why. I'm just taking this one. <laughs> I don't know. It's so dark. You just want to go, why? Why, why, why? You know, kind of like at the end of Fargo where she says, just for a little bit of money. Is this what? Uh, all for a little bit of money? There's more to life than a little bit of money. And I would say that to the Adelson family and to Katie Sigfredo and Luis Rivera, but they all had the same kind of values. The Adelson family is just so living at such a base level of food, stuff. It's so loveless. What a loveless exist existence. I mean, I don't think they have any real friends. Really. Um, what should we take a look at? How about a little bit from the society page? Hold on one second. Jeffrey Lacoste, please. There he is. Oh, thank Jeff, you. thank you for yeah. being here. No, seriously, Jeff, I mean it. Thank you, Jeff. My name is Jeffrey Lacasse, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-L-A-C-A-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, you seem quite, quite sincere. What? What's that music? <laughs> had told her that you know no man wants to date a single mom so we had this conversation repeatedly and then i show up to dinner and charlie's dating a single mom an extremely contentious divorce Jeff, thank you, Jeff. and wendy adelson drove me to charlie adelson's house at which point i I do recall observing that she was unusually jittery and being strange. I didn't know what to make of it at the time. Jeff, thank you, Jeff. She was a nervous wreck. Um, and I actually traveled to the store to buy her, I believe, some Pepto-Bismol. She was such a nervous wreck. She was having stomach problems. Thank you. So she wasn't food poisoned. She didn't have the flu. She wasn't sick. She just so... I don't remember that. Nervous that she was having stomach problems. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. thank you. Well, yeah, you didn't go anywhere with Wendy without hearing about No, no. Dan Markell's. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I was kind of tired of being strung along. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sir John from Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. You can bet that he has tons of Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so freaking grateful for my Jeff. No further questions. All right. We can release a witness. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right, you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so freaking grateful for my Jeff. Wow. Very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. You've been great, really. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming by. Thank you, 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 thank you,
back to Katie McBedawa. I am ready for Rashi, for Rashi's big, big moment, big, big dud moment where he thought he would would own her on the stand, and boy, didn't he! He Katie held her own. I think. I don't know. Tell me what you think. I thought she did it pretty well. Meeting that. Do you recall what meeting I'm referencing? Yes, ma'am. All right. Was that a restaurant that you met Charlie at after the bump? Yes, ma'am. Okay. In that meeting, and the jury hasn't heard this yet, but he's saying one of two scenarios. This is one of two scenarios. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, ma'am. I do. What were the one of two scenarios? What were the two scenarios? What he was speaking of was probably the FBI mm-hmm. or Tato um, blackmailing. And by Tato, you mean Rivera? Lewis Rivera, yes, ma'am. Were you concerned about that as well? Yes, ma'am, I was. And what did you do to try to figure out who it was that had approached Donna Adelson? I asked Sigfredo. So he was supposed to be looking into it? Yes, ma'am. Were you there whenever he did whatever he did to try to find out who it was? Was I where? Were you present when Sigfredo, I guess, went out and talked to people about whether- No, ma'am, I was not. Because at that time, was Rivera in custody? Yes, ma'am. He was, yeah, he was already doing his federal sentence, I believe. So was the concern that maybe some of his associates might have done this? Yes, ma'am. Maybe he had run his mouth about it? Yes, ma'am. Have you reviewed what I had marked for U.S. States Exhibit 111, the Dolce Vita recording with the transcript attached? Yes, ma'am, I did. And does the transcript in that exhibit accurately reflect the words that were said at that meeting between yourself and the defendant? Yes, ma'am. When the defendant described the bump to you, Right. When you were speaking with Charlie Adelson and also Sigfredo Garcia about this bump, did you speak in code? Yes, ma'am, I did. And what was the purpose of speaking in code? How to just piggyback with what Charlie was speaking to me in code. So I kind of was like, okay, if he's talking in codes, kind of speaking codes as well. Was the concern that the calls could be recorded, being recorded? Um, My concern was more that I was at work. So I really didn't want to say any phone numbers out loud or speak of what was going on. I'm going to approach and show you what I've marked as state's demonstrative A. Have you seen this before? I don't know if you have. No, ma'am, I have not. And it's got several items listed here as code words with the actual meaning next to them. Yes, ma'am. Would you take a moment to just, and the ones in red are the ones used by you. The ones in yellow are used by Charlie Adelson. Okay. Will you review this exhibit and just tell me if it's accurate as far as what the code means? Yes, ma'am, it's it's accurate. Judge, at this time, I'd ask to make use of state's demonstrative A. Yes, yes.
Right, but I think we have an agreement with a couple of redactions. Very well. You can go ahead and make those now. Uh, maybe if I can borrow a Sharpie from the clerk. Okay. Does anyone know what state demonstrative A is? I wonder what that is. Does anyone know? So curious. So if you're watching this, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, or leave me a comment. It really makes a difference. Leave me an emoji. I don't know. <laughs> Leave me it. Tell me anything. Uh, very curious, though, what people think of Katie McBanoa. A lot of people really react strongly to her. She's pretty horrible, <laughs> I'd say. But you're not going to get great people as defendants, I found, in murder cases. It's not too many people where you go, oh, that was a great guy. I'd love to have a drink with him. And if you do, there may be something a little bit wrong with you. Shall we move this along? Let me look into the listing. Oh, this will be a good investment. So it was really Charlie saying all these words. Charlie saying all these words. It was Charlie saying all these words. I would just want to kind of get to her cross. Can we get to her cross? I'm getting impatient. We have been going for an hour and a half. This may be a long show. Okay, here we go. Here's Rashi's big Perry Mason moment. You've just testified. Here we go. When you made it clear you weren't going to cooperate, right? Yes, sir. So you went to trial the second time, and this time you were convicted. Yes, sir. And you were convicted of first-degree murder and other charges, right? Yes, sir. A few weeks after your conviction... You were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus another 30 years. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you were transferred from the jail in Leon County to the state prison where you would spend the rest of your life, right? Yes, sir. Away from your family? Yes, sir. Away from your children? Yes, sir. And you realize that there are only two ways to get out of that prison, right? What are the two ways? Well, one way was in a coffin, right? Oh, it's like she's talking to her fairy godmother. What are the two ways I can get out of prison? Fairy, fairy law father? Well, one way is in a coffin. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. And the other way <laughs> is to cooperate. And you chose to cooperate. Yes, I did. But I chose to just tell some of the parts, some of it. I don't want to tell the parts that really make me look complicit and bad and immoral. I just want to say that I sort of like drifted into a murder plot somehow. I mean, this is where you think like Katie, like, I mean, does she have any interests besides, I mean, you can even see from her, Hold on, let me see if I can pull it up one more time. Even from her asking for for pen pals, like her interests are working out in yoga. So, and her history, work history was like assistance in, in medical offices. 
Did she have any hobbies besides working out? Interests besides making money? It doesn't seem like it. She went to school for some kind of like administration or something. Does anyone remember exactly what it was? Yes, sir. And the other way was cooperating against Charlie Adelson, right? No, sir. I wanted the truth to finally come out. What are the only two ways that you can ever get out of prison, Miss Magbanawa? My appeal. Oh, well, we'll get to that, too. You have an appeal pending right now, right? Yes, sir. That claims that you're innocent. Yes, sir. But let's just make this clear to the jury. Miss Kappelman has called you... Ding, 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 ding. Jared Tessas, I think he says medical administration. It was something like that. I mean, it's practical. I can't put that down. But she gets involved in this instead and with Sigfredo instead. I mean, just... Does anybody else remember that documentary that has Pam Smart in it? And she says something like, I made bad life de choices, bad life decisions. Pam Smart. Does anyone remember that case? I think Katie could be in that same writing class with Eve Ensler. <laughs> it's about Eve Ensler's writing class. And you're it's so it's so typical of these documentaries. These people are just, you know, struck, just made a bad life decision. Oops, you're in prison. <laughs> you know, like whoops, how did I get here? You're supposed to feel terrible for them. It, it, this kind of stuff. Now, having spent a lot of my time working with victims' families, and uh, it just enrages me. The lack, you know, okay, but it's like all we see are these documentaries of people in prison. And so little do we see the effect of, the, of their quote-unquote bad life choices what it really does to to families and loved ones of the victims as a witness against this man who's presumed innocent you've just testified that you did a murder and you have an appeal pending right now in this county claiming your innocence isn't that true yes sir And lo and behold, weeks after you were convicted and sentenced to life with no parole, you went in and met with the state, right? Yes, sir. And you met with them not once, but twice. Yes, sir. And you met with them for hours. You met with them not once, but twice. What's his point? It, it would it be, it's like you met with them not once did you talk to the prosecution to make a deal, but you talked to them twice. If you talked to them three times, would it be even worse, Rashi? What's, what's your point? What's your point with once or twice or three times? What does it matter how many times? The point is she, she made a deal. Yes, sir. A combined total of around six hours, right? Yes, sir. Now, we're going to get into that and all the lies that Ms. Kappelman didn't go through with you that you made during those interviews, but let's go back to the first trials first, okay? In each of those trials, you took the stand for your own defense, right? Yes, sir. And you took the same oath and looked at different jurors the same way that you look today, right? Yes, sir. And in your second trial, not only did you take an oath in this room, but isn't it true that you tried to get Sigfredo to lie for you? No, sir, I did not. Isn't it true that you were caught on a recording in the prison in which you were going to have Sigfredo Garcia come into the, your trial, your second trial, and say that he did the murder. Oh my, Laser Wolf. 
This is the most <laughs> on target comment ever made. Rashbaum looks like a well dressed ferret. Isn't he ferret like? <laughs> that is so on. I'm never going to be able to un unsee it now. Oh my. <laughs> Thank you for the belly laugh. Oh, he does. I loathe him. Murder with Charlie Adelson all by himself. No, sir. You never were on a recording never of that fact. That. Your plan at your second trial wasn't to have Sigfredo Garcia testify on your behalf? No, sir. Are you aware that your lawyer opened up on that plan? No, In sir, her opening? No. Well, did you sit through the trial? Yes, sir, I did. Did you sit through the trial when she said to the jury, you're going to hear from Sigfredo Garcia, who's going to say that the murder was between him and Charlie Adelson, and that you're just a victim of having bad taste in men? He never came up. He refused to come and testify, right? I don't know if he refused. He just never, he knew was never called. Are you aware that you and your lawyer subpoenaed him to come down to Leon County to testify on your behalf? He was subpoenaed, but he just never showed up. And he, he didn't he show up? He never took the stand. Right. He was subpoenaed by you, correct? Yes, sir. And you got on the phone with him. You were caught because you're not supposed to talk to each other, right? Yes, sir. But you guys talk to each other because what you do is you call it. Charlie Adelson looks like in pig heaven is the only way I can say it. Like excessive blinking starting. He looks like, oh, you're really getting him rashy. Little does he know that it's a lot of bluster and a lot of unlanded punches here. She's already admitted she lied. What? Yeah, I lied. So she's like, yeah, I lied. Yeah. I'll tell you why I did it. And it's a logical, rational reason. Do I think it's the whole reason? No. I think she thought she was going to win. I think the Adelsons were paying for her expensive lawyers. And she did get a hung jury the first time. But it's it's so stupid what she did. So dumb. It's hard to, it boggles the mind to be given a deal with no time. She just told everything. Here she is. She's not going to see her kids ever. I don't know what the state is going to take off, but I don't think it's going to be all that great. She might do 20, 30 years. 15, I would think at minimum. That's just my sense. I don't know. I'm not privy to what's going on with lessening her sentence. But someone's got to get through to Katie that the only way out is to tell the whole thing. Tell it all. Oh, his mom, right? Yes, and he calls his mom. Is it that what you all do? And the whole thing has nothing to do with that jet ski. Oh, they were so mad. And then Sigfredo Garcia wanted to call Charlie, didn't know how to, and called Harvey instead at his home. It wasn't that the whole Adelson family was in on this. No, no, no. Harvey, no. Wendy, no. That was all just a mistake. They were all insulated, isolated, whatever the word you want to use from the action. Give me a break. They're like the Adelson crime family. How many families get together and decide to all participate in a murder of this social class? Maybe more than we know, maybe more get away with it. Who knows? But the ones that we know, I haven't seen a story like this. And that's what makes it so horrible, rich people using poor people. And getting away with it for so long. I was listening to Stephen Epstein's podcast, uh, David on David Latt's podcast. Someone put it up in my Facebook group, the Georgia Kaplman Appreciation Society. 
And boy, is that guy a dud, Stephen Epstein. He starts out going, oh, yeah, oh, we over my dead bodies, just like cereal. And now that Adnan Syed has been, been exonerated because he got out on a, on a fraud that's being litigated currently in the courts in Baltimore on this supposed new evidence. One of the people is Adnan Syed himself from a witness talking about the uh, murderer harassing Heyman Lee. And the other is the DNA on the shoes of Heyman Lee. No, not on her feet in the back of her car. I mean, what are we talking about? Stephen Epstein, the exoneration. And then, and then he talks about Wendy harassing him, which I think is so funny because he was so soft and said, oh, she had nothing to do with this, this murder. It was all done for her as a big gift. And as you know, and as I've said before, wow, what a gift. What a risky gift. Because if that's a gift gone wrong, oh, you didn't want the whole family to murder your ex-husband? That's a gift you can't return. And a gift that sends you to prison for life. Look at Charlie. At that time, yes, sir. Yeah, you call each other so that you could talk to each other through the mom. And during one of those calls, you asked him to come testify on your behalf. Isn't that what you did? No, I did not ask him. Okay, but we'll move on to some other lies. During your first trial, you were asked, you didn't ask Mr. Garcia to help this lady get her kids back in Tallahassee. Answer, no, ma'am. You didn't solicit him to commit a murder of Dan Markell. Answer, no, ma'am. Do you recall those questions and answers? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's ironic, but, but, except an even better point, which does anybody remember that Charlie was fully going to, fully prepared to continue his, <laughs> continue the murder it's ironic that didn't Charlie threaten to get rid of the person? Yeah, I said, yeah, if he's talking, we need to get rid of him. Like, I got another job for sick Fredo. Oh, no, he was in prison at that time. Ruby D, Dora, sorry, Ruby Dora. Cool picture. Thanks so much for the super sticker. So appreciate it. Allows me to spend my time making this content for you. I appreciate it. You were asked, well, back then, did you know someone by the name of Dan Markell? Answer, no, ma'am. In 2014, you learned that Wendy Edelson's divorce was already finalized, right? I learned that in court. I didn't know it before. Do you remember those Yes. Those words, those were lies, right? Yes, I lied in my trials to save myself. We'll keep going. You lied when you said that Charlie told you that Professor Markell had been in an accident, right? I lied that. Say it again, sir. Well, I'll ask you the questions. Do you remember having a conversation with Charlie Adelson about his brother-in-law being in an accident? Does that sound familiar to you? It yeah. sounds familiar. Yeah, that was a lie, right? No, that's what Charlie said. He that told you that he was in an accident. He'd tell you that there was a murder. No, he told me he was in an accident. So you didn't know about the murder of Dan Markell on July 18th. Is that what you're telling this jury? No, not at that time. Well, when did you find out about the murder of Dan Markell? It was later on. Oh, really? So the money that you bought. You would remember that totally. This is where she looks stupid. She knew what she was doing. She knew what she was getting involved with. Just come out and say it, Katie. You don't have any reputation except as a liar now. You come out and tell everything. At least you'd have a little, some people would have a little, little bit of respect for you. Took you a long time, but you eventually came clean. Come on. And I think that would be curtains for Wendy. The 
the puzzle piece that we all need, right? You guys up for a long, I mean, I can cut this short. If you guys are getting bored, I mean, I'm not saying you can totally say you're getting bored or it's going on too long. This is might be a long one tonight. Or we could save it for another time. Brought to the guys that Miss Kaplan brought up on opening. The money you brought up to the guys on July 19th was because Dan Markell was in an accident? I didn't know that that was Dan Markell. Like, I didn't know his name. Oh. But there was oh. a murder that happened, yes. At the March 11th dinner that you had with Mr. Lacoste at Yardburg, Dan Markell's name wasn't mentioned? No, sir. Would it surprise you that Mr. Lacoste has testified to the opposite of that? No, I haven't seen his testimony. At your first trial, you were at... Curtains for Wendy Bossy Texas, Texas Chick and hello Bossy Texas Chick. Because I think that there's a connection from, well, from what Luis Rivera said that Fredo was pointing out Wendy and the children. And now you can say, oh, it was, wasn't Wendy's day for the children. She had a habit of picking them up. Excuse me, I had a cough when it wasn't her day. And I think that probably was Wendy with the children on that street being picked out. Either way... Uh, strangely, Fredo gets a call from Katie, get the heck out of that area. I think Katie knows a lot more about Wendy's involvement and a lot more about Harvey's involvement. I do not buy this story about Sigfredo and his confronting Charlie when they had the jet skis in the back of the car. Because that's not how, how harassment works that I've seen. I hate to sound like Charlie. That's not how it works, that, that, how extortion works. But generally, people don't go from ne not a phone call, not a comment, nothing to Charlie from Sigfredo, total avoidance to, hey, I see you. I'm with my kids, and I'm going to confront you in the street. And it doesn't. Maybe I can see Charlie being a wimp in real life and just saying nothing, but probably I think Charlie would have had verbal Charlie says nothing, not even a comment to him, doesn't even mouth off to him. Seems like a made up story to give a reason why Sigfredo called Harvey at home. I think she knows a lot more. And I think she thinks like, oh, well, if I say I didn't know what was going to happen. And Wendy apparently was using that word accident, something she was asked about. I think that that may have been the language of the Adelsons, a fatal accident. I think they used a lot of euphemisms, like, say, TV, <laughs> the TV is five, a lot of code words. Uh, code words, talking around, euphemisms, because they weren't a part of this in their mind, right? They're all in this kind of, they know they were, they know, they all know the truth. They haven't convinced themselves uh, otherwise, but they're all going to tell themselves that Charlie's innocent, Donna's falsely accused, Wendy had nothing to do with it. That's the echo chamber among the Edelson family. That's why I say it's cult-like. As long as you're saying the right things, you're you're welcome in the cult. That's why Rashbaum's so close to them. He's willing to go along with all this. Remember, he says, I'm so glad when he had Charlie as a client, so glad to have an innocent client. And he doesn't have to say that as a defense attorney. You He has to argue for acquittal in, in court. State hasn't proved their case, blah, blah, blah. But to tell the press he has an innocent client and hammer that point home like he is with Donna. And he doesn't have to say Donna's a wonderful person. 
and so loving. Give me a break, Rashi. I'm very loving. The last time I saw Dan Markell, I gave him some banana bread and a hug. I'm the kind of huggy banana bread grandmother everybody loves. Thank you, Donna, but other people would, would beg to differ. So, yeah, I think Katie could bring it all down. Asked, did Charlie mention anything to you about a murder out of Tallahassee? So now it's not Dan Markell. It's just a murder out of Tallahassee. And your answer was no, ma'am. Question, did he mention anything about his ex-brother-in-law being murdered? Answer, no, ma'am. Do you recall those questions? Yes, sir. And those were lies, right? Yes, I told you I lied. I lied in my trials to save myself. I, I understand. Please let me keep going through them. There's a lot of them, so take we'll take our time. Yes, sir. Now, you said you never saw any cash at Charlie's place. Do you recall that at trial? He had cash, but I just never, I didn't know how much he had. I know he keeps cash in his, in his um, safe. But I thought you just testified moments ago that you never saw cash at his place. They didn't keep cash at his place. Joy says, I don't think they have dirt on Rashbaum. I wasn't saying they have anything on Rashbaum. I'm just saying that Rashbaum talks the talk. That's why they love him. He talks, I mean, one of the reasons, he talks the party line, the, the Adelson line. They're all wrongfully accused or wrongfully convicted, depending on whether you're talking about Donna or Charlie. But Rashbaum loves the money and he loves the attention. He thinks he's going to springboard his career as Rashbaum bias for the next 20, 30 years. But unfortunately, you have to win a case to really get a reputation like that <laughs> once in a while. And supposedly his parents had to bring the cash. Isn't that what you just told this jury about uh, 18 minutes ago? An abundance of cash. Have you seen a safe? Yes, sir. Have you ever seen it open? Yes, sir. Doesn't he keep a lot of cash that he collects on the top of his safe? I mean, I'm not like looking in it, but every single time we used to go out, he used to grab some money from the from the safe and then take it with him. Repeatedly during both trials, you said you worked at the Adelson Institute. You never worked at the Adelson Institute, no, right? No, sir, I did not. Now we're going to hear about a Lexus. Yes, sir. You said you paid for that Lexus. You never paid for that Lexus. Isn't that I paid Charlie cash for that Lexus. Really? Yes. Okay. I think the state might disagree. Has the state disagreed with you on that point? About me paying him cash? Yes, because there was nothing that was coming out of my account, but I paid him cash. I love how Rashbaum thinks he's smiling. He thinks he's scoring a big point. It's not a big point to say that Katie got Harvey's old Lexus. I know it fits in with your theory, but your theory is ridiculous. You're, thank you, Rashbaum, for making the state's case for them. <laughs> I mean, come on. I had the cash on me. During the trial, the first trial, you were asked, do you know why it is that Charlie chose you out of all of his ex-girlfriends to call? I don't. I don't know why he called me. Do you recall those questions? Yes, sir. That was a lie, right? I told you I lied in my first and second trial to save myself. Well, let's get to the second trial. Just like you're lying here to save yourself, right? I'm not saving myself. I'm telling the truth this time. Right, because now all of a sudden, after eight years, you have developed a conscience. I think that's what you told the jury. No, it's because my the father of my children was on death penalty at that time on my first trial. So I couldn't I couldn't give up if I if it was just Well that explains why she lied at her first trial. What about her second trial? We that's what I would ask. Just Charlie, like I said from the trial, go ahead and arrest him. Nobody ever did. 
he didn't get the death penalty after the first trial and he was convicted, right? Yes, sir. And by the time of his second trial, you had no reason to protect him anymore. He was done. No, sir. He was under appeal. Okay. Just like you're under appeal now. Yes, sir. So what you said to this jury about 20 minutes ago is you said to this jury, I'm here today to tell the truth. And I want to get your exact words. Because I want to do the right thing. Yes, sir. Isn't it because you want to go home? And that's the only way that you could ever go home is to help them. That's the only way you can go home by not being dead. I was not promised anything. By not being dead. As if if she's dead, she can go home. I think that's debatable, Rashi, on what you believe. But as you see, he talks so much, he kind of dilutes the point there. I really, you really need to come in quick and say, how about your second trial? What was the point? For, why, why did you lie at your second trial? And you can say to save yourself. But a jury can understand why someone who got an incredibly long sentence for being the middle woman was offered deals would come around after doing a bit of her sentence. They weren't born yesterday. I'm doing this solely on myself. Clearly you don't even see my attorneys in this room. Let's talk about the second trial. Yeah, because those attorneys, when the Edelson stop paying, they don't have the money to hang out in court while you watch you testify, Katie. Again, you lied when you testified that you didn't know anything about or were involved in the murder of Professor Markell, right? Yes, sir. I told you I lied in my first and second trial to save myself. Ma'am, we've heard it. If you could just answer the questions. Did yes, you sir. lie? Yes, sir. You lied when you testified that you knew nothing about Wendy's divorce, Wendy Edelson's divorce. Yes, sir. You lied when you said you didn't pick up money from Charlie's house on July 18th. Yes, sir. You lied when you said uh, you knew nothing about stapled cash. Yes, sir. You lied when you said you didn't bring the money to Sigfredo or, or Luis, Luis Rivera the next day. Yes, sir. You lied again when you said you worked as a personal assistant for Charlie, right? Yes, sir. You lied repeatedly when you tried to discuss what would ha had happened, what was being spoken at Dolce Vita, correct? Yes, sir. All right, well, now let's talk about the lies that you told that the state didn't go over with you. Let's talk about your proffers. So you were interviewed by the state twice in October and November 2022, correct? Yes, sir. And by the way, you've met with them a couple of times since then. Look at Charlie. Look at him with his fist on on the pen pointed at Katie. Like he's like he's gonna stab her with that pen. Look at that face. It's like, get her, Rashi, get her. Like, he, no love lost between Charlie or no lost love, no, no love feelings from Charlie to Katie, certainly right now. Wow. I didn't see that before. Then, right? A couple times. Have you met with after? them since? Yeah, after that point? Probably one time. You met with Miss Kappelman? Yes, yes, sir. Did Ms. Kappelman ask you about our defense during that meeting? No, sir. She didn't ask you about whether, for the first time, whether you ever threatened uh, no, Charlie sir. Adelson? Now, when you met them, met with them in October and November of 2022, 
This was after you got your life sentence, right? Yes, sir. And um, you met with them first in Marion County Jail on October 11th, right? Marion County Jail? No, sir. I've never been in that county. You met with them in the jail. I got the wrong jail, obviously. I've never met with them in any jails. Where did you meet with them? I the was already in, in DOC. Okay. In Lowell. You met with them in prison? Yes, sir. Apologies. And the second time, you met with them at the state attorney's office, right? Here in Tallahassee? Yes, sir. And both times, Special Agent Sanford was there? Seriously, Brashy, get off your high horse. Oh, sorry, my apologies. So sarcastic. You were actually in prison, an even worse place than jail. I just meet with my clients, my murderous clients in jail. Like he's above it. Give me a break. Ah, oh, what a sleazeball. Yes, sir. Investigator Jason Newland was there. Yes, sir. And TPD investigator Sherry Bennett were there. Yes, sir. And they asked you questions. Yes, sir. And each time you told them. And Janine Driver, the body language expert, was there. Apparently your palms were up, so everything was okay. A version of events that was very different from what you said at your trials, right? Yes, sir. In fact, during those six hours of interviews, you told them about five more versions, right? Five different versions of it? Yeah. No, sir. Oh, so you told them the same thing throughout the six hours that you met with them? I believe so, but I think the first time you can't even visit more than two hours, so I don't know where you're getting six hours. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, let's look. The first interview started at uh, 9.26 a.m., and it ended at 11.44 a.m., so a little over two hours. Yes, sir. First interview. Your position right now, what you're telling this jury, is that the same thing you told them in the first interview, you told them in the second interview? I believe so, yes, sir. You believe so or you know so? I know so. I believe so. I believe you so. You absolutely know so. No, I don't, not verbatim exactly what I said. Oh, he's, he's ready for his Perry Mason moment. Are you ready? He's going to squash her with an inconsistency between her two interviews. Is it true that during the entire first interview, you said you had nothing to do with the murder? No, sir, I didn't say that. All right, well, we're going to go through exact quotes, and we'll see if your memory can be refreshed. Yes, sir. By the way, during any of these interviews, did you give them any documentation, anything new, any text messages, documentation, WhatsApps, any new, as people call it, receipts? Did you give them any new evidence? No, I'm in prison. I don't have anything. It, it was just your words, right? Yes, sir. So let's talk about what you said. During the first proffer, which was a little over two hours. Yes, sir. You raised your hand and they put you under oath, right? Yes, sir. And throughout the proffer, the agents, particularly Special Agent Sanford, kept on telling you that you have to tell the truth, right? Yes, sir. He didn't believe you. I mean, whatever his reasons are. Was he know. frustrated with you during the interview? Yes, sir. In fact, one hour and eight minutes into the proffer, he said to you that you were minimizing your involvement. Hearsay, Your Honor. So let's go back. Your position, what you've told this jury, is you are completely consistent. You told the same story during the entire proffer, right? I can't, I, like I told you, I can't remember verbatim what I've said from the first proffer and the second proffer. Let's just talk about the... And we're still frustrated with you, Katie. There's so much more you could say. You know so much more. You were so close to Charlie, who was the... I don't know if he was the mastermind. I would say Donna was pretty close to that, but he was the co, co, co maestro with Donna in this. You were his girlfriend at the time. 
And there's no such thing really as intimacy among the Adelsons. They don't do intimacy. But you were around. You know a lot more, Katie. Come out with it. Talk about nothing to lose. Isn't it frustrating, this case? Like we have Wendy immunized. Of course, she's going to protect herself and her family, lying with immunity. We have Katie telling us a, a quarter of the quarter of the story. And it's taken years and years and years and years for us to know this much. The first proffer. Yes, sir. Your view is that from the beginning of the first proffer to the end of the first proffer, you said the same thing throughout. That's what you're telling this jury. From the first proffer to the second proffer that I'm saying the same exact thing? I don't remember verbatim what I've said. How about from the beginning of the first? Tommy DV, thank you so much for becoming a member. First proffer to the end of the first proffer. What you told the jury is you were consistent from the beginning of the first proffer to the end of the first proffer. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. Is that still your testimony? No, I, that I'm, I was consistent about it? No, because it was very hard for me to confess what I've done. So let me ask the question again. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that during the first proffer, for the first one hour and eight minutes, you continued to say that you didn't murder Professor Markell? No, sir, I didn't say that. I, I don't understand your answer. So let me rephrase. Okay. Isn't it true that for the first half of the first proffer, you denied participation in the murder of Professor Markell. No, sir. I was telling him what happened. And how uh, thank you so much, B Rabbit. This is um, very touching to see so many big people become members. Very touched. Thank you so much. Best birthday gift. Of course, it's not my birthday yet. It's Saturday. But it looks like we're on our way to hit 2 million views. And um, pretty exciting to see all the all these memberships. Thank you. How my involvement in it. So your position is that throughout yes, the entire first proffer, you admitted that you participated in the murder of Professor Markell. Yes, sir. Judge, may I proceed now? Would it surprise you that one hour and eight minutes into the first proffer, Special Agent Sanford said that you were minimizing your involvement in Professor Markell's murder? Like he stated, I was minimizing it. It was hard for me to confess everything that I've suppressed for the past seven years. Eleven minutes later, he said that what you were telling him made absolutely no sense. Do you recall him saying that? No, sir, I did not. Well, let me see if I can show you. Thank you guys so much. Sky Troop, five memberships. Whoa. Very generous. Thank you so much. And Sherry Davis, <laughs> it's your birthday week. Oh, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate it. Like I said in the beginning of this episode, let me know. I have a few ideas, but let me know if there's something particular you want to do Saturday on my actual day of birth, 51, the big five one. I'd like it to be a kind of party. Does this refresh your recollection 
and Special Agent Stanford said all of it doesn't no, no, make no, sense. No, 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 I'll, 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 I'll try it. Please allow her to Does this refresh your recollection of what Agent Stanford said? Just the line that you highlighted? You can read before and after to make sure I'm not doing lawyer tricks. Yes, sir. Can I? Of course. Yes, sir. Not the slam dunk you thought it would be, Charlie, huh? Not the slam dunk. A lot of blinking. A lot of disappointed yes, blinking. saying that why am I not remember conversations, specific conversations, and I told him I can't recall those specific conversations. Was he telling you that what you were saying didn't make sense to him? I'm going to object to what Agent Stanford said or his opinion. Sustain, please lay the foundation to impeach specifically. At some point in the interview, did he walk out on you? Uh, yes, he did on the second interview. Yeah, okay. We're going to get to that. That's like four and hours into your combined interviews, right? I believe so. Right. So you come back and I think it's over an hour into the second interview. So actually my math isn't great. It's like three and a half hours into interviewing. Agent Sanford gets so upset. Judge, I'm going to object to Agent Sanford's. I'll, I'll be phrased. Yeah, she's killing it, Georgia, on the, excuse my turn of phrase there, but she's really doing well with those objections, those hearsay objection, objections, and she's sticking with it because they're working. She's getting them sustained. So um, thank you. I'm a unicorn. We want to celebrate with you. I think that's what you said. And thank you very much. Nora, for wishing me a happy birthday, and everyone else who did. Saturday, hopefully, we'll have a big, big party on the actual day. He's withdrawing the question. Please move on. Around three hours into these interviews, Agent Sanford decides to leave the room, right? Yes, sir. He was frustrated with you, right? I believe so. Truthfully... During your first interview, you kept on saying all of these things were jumbled in your head, right? Yes, sir. You said that about 11 times. Do you recall that? I don't recall how many times I said it, no, sir. You said that eventually 33 minutes into the interview, you said you arranged through an envelope that... Great point. Tad, Charlie Adelson is befuddled and disappointed how poorly this is going. Rash is making Katie seem like the smart one. It, I've never seen a more expressive defendant than Charlie. Everything is told on his face, the whole story. And he's gone from being psyched, go get him, and then anger, and now just disappointment. He's such a, thank you very much, cloud of despair for the super sticker. Really appreciate it. Pretty horse. But now he's like, but he's still telling himself he's going to beat this. You know that to be true. Charlie gave you, but that you never opened it for Sigfredo to rough up Professor Markel. Do you recall saying that? Repeat the question. 
33 minutes into the interview. Yes, sir. You admitted that you arranged through an envelope that Charlie gave you, but that you never opened. Yes, sir. For Sigfredo to rough up Professor Markel. Do you recall that? I've never said Professor Markel's name. To rough up the deceased. What do you mean by that? Can you explain? You told them 33 minutes into the interview. Yes. That Charlie had given you an envelope that you had never opened, that miraculously got to Sigfredo Garcia, and the purpose of it was to rough up his ex-brother-in-law. No, because I didn't know what the contents of what was in the envelope, so I wouldn't have said that. You said that somehow that plan had transitioned to murder, but according to what you told investigators, you never knew when that happened. Do you recall saying that? Repeat the question again, sir. You said that somehow the rough up plan had transitioned to murder. I never said rough up or any of those words. That's why it's confusing me what All right, you're well, stating. Let, 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 let's say it again. Yes. Sir. You said that somehow the plan had transitioned to murder. But according to what you told investigators, you never knew when that transition happened. Well, at that time, I didn't know. At the time that you were interviewed? No, not in my interview, but when it was happening, as they're interviewing me and we're going through the scenario. I'm going to show you 186 to 187. You know what? I'll just move on. You told investigators during your first interview, two hours into it, two hours and one minute to be exact. Yes, sir. That you never spoke to Charlie about the change in plans. I never spoke to Charlie about the change in plans. Meaning it going to become a murder. I'm confused about the questions you're asking. Is this what I said? Yes, what you said to these investigators just a year ago, after you were convicted for life, didn't you tell investigators you didn't know it was going to be a murder? I, When we were talking about this, like I said, it was hard for me to confess my involvement in this. Right. So Can you, you show me where I said this? Let's just Let's just go with what you just said. Yes, sir. So two hours into your first interview... When you said this, you still were not admitting that you had a part in the murder. Yes, it was very hard for me to do this. Cloud of Despair, thank you so much for becoming a member. Appreciate it. Enjoy the banana bread emoji. But, I mean... I, I don't think he's getting anywhere. He's so he really thought this would be his, his banner day, Rashi, for for his cross examination here, and boy was it not. This especially that they came to me in prison. Where right. why are all these investigators coming in? Okay, so we are now where we started, which is during this first proffer, just a year ago, under oath again. You refused to admit at first that you had anything to do with the murder, that you were a part of the murder. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. It's hard for me to admit it. Yes, sir, it is. It's still hard for you to admit it, Katie. Still hard. Come out with it. Eric Frazier, thank you so much. Remember the 70s cartoon, Mr. Jinx? I can hear Rashi say, I hate those Mises to pieces. I don't, uh, Eric, but I'll check it out. Oh, he's just, he's really, I, I thought he was a better guy in the beginning. You know, I just thought he was just sort of like what you'd say in Yiddish, like, I don't know, like, uh, I won't say it that way. Uh, how will I say it? Like, just sort of uh, 
like an unfortunate guy who got saddled with this case. The greed got the best of him. But he really, what I hear is he really wanted this case. He wanted to represent Charlie. He wanted to represent Donna. He thinks this is the big case that that he's going to get build a big business on. It's still hard for me to admit it right now. Okay. During your first proffer, nine minutes and 14 seconds into it, do you recall being asked the following questions? And as you saw in trial, Garcia and Rivera made a trip in June. What can you tell us about that? Answer. See, like, like I don't even remember. I, I'm getting awfully tired of this. I don't know about you guys. I think we could come back to it maybe. But I got something else for you. Oh, thank you, Miss Lisa. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Thank you so much, Miss Lisa. If you're not subscribed to Miss Lisa, her YouTube channel, you're missing out on some great Adelson related shorts. I'll tell you that. Thank you for the super sticker. But I have a body language expert for you. Everyone's favorite, right? Don't we all just think those body language experts are so on point? But Core TV did a little piece on Katie and I think it's Vinnie Politan. And here's the what the body language expert had to say about Katie and her testimony and the testimony, different trials and communications expert and instructor at the Body Language Institute, Tiffany Lee, back with us. Tiffany, great to see you. Good to see you. Let's do this. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to show two videos back to back. The first will be Catherine McBanawa in 2019 and then Catherine McBanawa today. Let's take a look. Did you have anything to do with the murder of Don Markell? No, ma'am. Did you get the father of your children, Mr. Garcia, to commit a murder on behalf of Mr. Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am. Did you have a trial in your case? Yes, ma'am. Did you testify? Yes, ma'am. You testified in your own, on your own behalf? Yes, ma'am. All right, and when you testified, were you truthful with the jury? No, ma'am, I was not. Did you take the same oath that you just took today in your own trial? Yes, ma'am. What was your defense when you were tried? That I had nothing to do with it. All right, Did that we got it right in reference to Charlie Adelson and we got it right in reference to the killers, yes, but you weren't in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Was that true? No, ma'am, it was not. Were you in the middle? Yes, ma'am, I was. Sigfredo Garcia was involved. Yes, ma'am, he was. So why tell the truth now? I believe that the truth needed to come out now so that the family can get some type of closure. Why didn't the truth need to come out last year or the year before or the I, year before that? I was trying to defend myself. You were trying to get off. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 2019 versus 2023. What do you see? Okay, let's get into this. So 2019, we see a lot of her when she's saying the yes ma'am and the no ma'am. Her mouth is saying one thing, but then her head is going in a different direction. So she's saying no ma'am in 2019, but then she, she's nodding her head yes versus in the video from now, all of her movements are congruent. So when she when they're asking her, uh, why are you coming forward now? Or was what you said true then? Is this true? She's saying yes, and her head is saying yes. So I'm willing to believe that she is telling the truth now. Much more credible. That's because uh, this is a big part of this case. This is crucial. 2019, exactly. she said nothing to do with it. 2023, I'm in the middle of all of it. And what you're saying is her body is making sense in 2023. 
Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Everything is congruent. Now, she actually testified three times. So now I'm going to show you three different videos back to back to back. 2019 trial, 2022 trial, and then again today in 2023. Let's take a look. Do you have information that Charlie Edelson was involved in this? Do I have information? I mean, based on everything that we've been seeing, but I don't have personal information. Based on everything you, you've seen, do you think Charlie was involved in this? Yes. Do you think Charlie was lying to you? Yes. To this day. She doesn't have personal information. What other kind of information? I have general information that they... That the public knows. I've just been watching the trial. Just been hanging out watching the trial. Personal information. Either you're in the know or you don't. What kind of hedge is that? Ridiculous. But what do you think about the looks of Katie? Did it do her favor? I mean... You know, they're, sometimes they're, they have a whole costumers to dress these people up. I don't know what they're stylists, a better word for it, to dress up defendants. Paid stylists. For example, Keith Ranieri and the Menendez brothers both wore colorful sweaters to court. So they'd look like... They were peaceful and like the guy next door and Mr. Rogers type, inoffensive. And they also dressed up the Adel, uh, the Adelsons, the Menendez brothers to make them, they always referred to them as the boys. And I mean, they were in their 20s. Also to make them look younger. I mean, the braids are cute in her hair, but I don't know if they it makes her look, it brings out a very severe quality in her. They certainly have made her look more dowdy and less like a bombshell that you see in the thumbnail to this episode, but I'm not sure it helped her. What do you think? Hey, do you think he's guilty? Yes, ma'am. Do you believe that he should be prosecuted for his involvement in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you think he should come forward and let the jury know that you had nothing to do with this? Yes, ma'am. Who came up with the idea to kill Dan Markell? Charlie. So, Sigfredo Garcia didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. Luis Rivera didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. When did the defendant first bring this idea up to you? My first recollection was around Halloween of 2013. Around Halloween or on the actual? On, on Halloween, yes, ma'am. All right. What, what, what's your recollection of how that came up? Um, we were at a Halloween party in Lincoln Road. And right before we were about to go, he got in the car with me and he asked me a question. What was the question? Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Who was that? Sigfredo. Okay, the before and after. The first so two trials. So the first two trials. Um, she's testifying on her own behalf. This trial testifying for the prosecution. Exactly. So from the first trial, the 2019, you see her when she, um, they're asking her a question, and she then. I mean, just to picture her with her hair down and little, like a little floral blouse and a cardigan, sort of make her look younger and softer. It's hard with that, with who she is. It's incongruent with the tough. I mean, boy, are all of Charlie's women tough. They're either like, you know, oh, done, like what my mother say, what my mother say, she looks ready or done, you know, over the top. Either their, their sexuality is forward 
but there's always something like incredibly tough about all of them. Even June. I mean, who says, you know, there, Charlie's perfect except for that murder conviction or accusation, depending on, you know what I mean? Who says that? You got to be pretty callous. And I think it was fancy fiction who was talking about making peace with June and talking to her and she and June saying, well, I, I've never seen it from the Markell's point of view. I've only seen it from the Adelson. How? How is that even possible as a human being? I know she's not the brightest bulb. But I mean, that's, I, I just think these women are so greedy so lacking in compassion and empathy. It's amazing. If he weren't accused of murder, he'd be perfect. Never mind the cheating and what we know of his character. Repeats the question. When we see this, this is something that we call, this is a technique of stalling. Stalling and also trying to distance yourself from the question. So instead of just saying a yes or a no, she goes through the, well, maybe, and from what I recall. So that's one thing to really pay attention to. And then in that same one, she says, I didn't have info, but she shakes her head yes. Now we're going to move on to the second one. She's doing a lot of the, the same, the yes ma'am, the no ma'am. And what I want you to take notice to is her tone between the second trial and then moving into the third trial, even her tone starts to change. So when she started in 2019, it was more, more of a stern, more of a stern type of tone. And now when she comes up, it's very soft and it's yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and yes, and I did, or I didn't, versus no, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am where we saw in the beginning. So her tone is even lowering. So this is again, an indicator that in this testimony in 2023, she is being honest. Well, we'll see how the jury interprets all of it because I mean, Charlie Adelson's on trial, but her testimony is also on trial, especially in light of the fact that she's has to admit. Yeah, and court TV and long crime always like to seems to me be very in line with the defense and they were saying oh it's terrible for the prosecution terrible choice didn't it turned out pretty well for them i think she was she wasn't the whole of she wasn't the end be all or end all but she was an important to quote rashi an important puzzle piece and she held her own against Rashbaum, who Rashi, who had been spending a lot of time crafting a cross examination that was supposed to destroy her. That she's, all you know, I was thinking about Charlie's testimony, and um, I don't know why I woke up thinking about that this morning, <laughs> and thinking that. Maybe it was the Jibbers video where he goes through with the maestro points. I played that recently on this channel, going through his testimony. And he really failed spectacularly in the most underwhelming way. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not something that you can say like any one moment. There was no like Perry Mason moment. There's no moment where... George, you know, one moment where Georgia just crushed him and killed him and showed. But there was a lot of little moments where he showed his arrogance. He showed how foolish his defense was. He would have been better off not taking the stand. And I, I've never seen a witness better off taking the stand than not. Do you remember a witness like that guilty, a guilty defendant taking the stand who turns out better and better shape taking the stand than they were beforehand can you think of one Jody Arias nightmare it's just watching uh, Todd Kenhammer it's a great cross examination I might do an episode on that terrible 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 one of the worst ever who else took the stand uh 
<laughs> I'm going to say Wednesday, but it's not her trial. Durst, terrible. Got there. There were some Perry, Perry Mason moments in that. He admitted he committed perjury five times already in the trial. That was a winner. He's a liar. So they've got to get a reason to believe. Do you find that the body language is something that we pick up on, even if we're not experts, that someone will come across more credibly? if their body language is congruent, as you said, versus someone who is right. lying? Absolutely. Have you ever met someone and you're like, I just I just don't like this person. There's something about this person. I can't put it together. I can't figure it out. But it's something about this person that I don't like. A lot of times when you have that feeling, it's because of their body language, their body did something that you may not have known what it was. But again, we on that subconscious level, your brain is telling you something is going on. So it definitely, when you have that feeling, pay attention to it and just notice it and see what's going on in the moment when you have that feeling. Yeah, if you've read Gavin DeBecker's The Gift of Fear, I was trained by Gavin DeBecker's company when I was Oprah. Threat assessment. Andrew Mack, thank you so much. Hi, Roberta. I listened to your last show today while getting gum surgery. Oh, I hope you're I hope you're not in too much pain, Andrew. From my periodontist, who by the way has the last name Rashbaum. Oh no. At least it's not Adelson. I kid you not. At least he didn't. I don't know if you know about Harvey's. What do you call them when you're doing wrong as a doctor? Help me out. The word just escaped my mind. But his lawsuits for being a terrible dentist, he he like had someone's whole face cave in. That's the YouTube friendliest way. But he broke several places in their face. So malpractice, bless you guys, rabbit. Everyone who said malpractice, cat, everybody. Everybody who said malpractice, murder by maestro, everyone. Thank you for helping me out. Malpractice lawsuits. So, yeah, I think I might come back to Katie. This We've been going for, for two and three quarters hours. Uh, I think I'm going to end the way I usually do with a victim impact statement, just a short one for tonight. This is from the Beth Shalom Synagogue, written June 14, 2019. And that's in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. To whom it may concern, I have been called with great heartache to write this letter regarding the tragic loss of Dan Markell. I had the pleasure of meeting Dan at a number of his family celebrations that I had officiated as a rabbi to his sister's family. Dan at those times stood at to me for his smart stood out to me, excuse me, there's a typo here, out to me for his smile, engaging energy, and passion for his family. My efforts in this letter is to express the loss from what I have seen in his family. Since Dan's murder, the scope of his loss is incalculable and inconsolable. For Ruth and Phil, there is no not there is no expectation that life gets back to normal because there is nothing normal after the loss of a child. At best, one may find a new normal. There is also the loss of contact with Dan's children their grandchildren, which denies them the comfort of seeing Dan's living legacy grow and flourish in the world. For his sister Shelley, her husband Ian, and their children Michael, Ari, and Roni, the loss of family is measured in relation to the kind of connection they had before the murder. 
To this, I can attest the familiar bonds were deep and loving. There could never be a full or real family celebration without Dan being present, and his absence colors and darkens every moment they have enjoyed and will enjoy in the future. It is the loss of a brother, an uncle, and the loss of nephews and cousins, which is to say there are losses in life that seldom exist without an echo. Just for those in the back. There are losses in life that seldom exist without an echo. And Dan's murder is no exception to this. It leaves a devastating gap in their lives. And none of this, of course, accounts for the what if. What of the people he would have met, the love he would have shared, the joyous moments he would have celebrated, the comfort he would have provided in challenging times, the academic work that would have influenced the world we live in. Therein lies the insight to your request for a victim impact statement. The true impact is the denial of all the things that might have been, but now will never be. Sincerely, Rabbi Aaron Flansrak, Senior Rabbi, Beth Shalom Synagogue, Toronto, Ontario. All right, guys, I am off tomorrow, but I will see you Saturday. If you guys have ideas for, for something you want it to do on Saturday, leave it in the general comment section, the live comment section, the general comment section of this video. Please hit the thumbs up. Really helps the algorithm. Leave me a comment in the general section, not the live section of this episode and I will read some of them on the next episode we have on Saturday. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for listening.